Ladies and gentlemen, the Football Scoop Podcast is back. It's Monday. I'm actually here. Last week, I was not here. Zach Barnett uh, took the reins, and then, uh, I don't know, he set this podcast back a long ways. I was uh, I was hurt. I was like punched to the gut when I spent the first minute listening to Mean Girls' discussion. <laughs> <laughs> and then he came back to it at the end. I'm like, no, 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 Zach, no. We will never speak of this again. Appreciate it. Thank you. Till next year on that day. Yeah. No, 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 no. No, we'll specifically <laughs> not pod. No, we won't. So, we will, so we will Zach does that. In 325. Dak, Zach does that. And then Vanderbilt beats Alabama. I don't know if they're if, – if, I don't know, but it happened. There's no way to start anywhere but there. Pavia on the field, his interview afterwards was pure gold. Uh, the guy's a hot mess. He's a baller. Dude just comes to play and lets it rip. And uh, golly, he's got to be fun to have in your locker room. Gentlemen, I'm going to open the floor. Any thoughts, Vanderbilt, Alabama, the floor is yours. Let's go, I'll start. Doug. You go uh, about it. Uh, yeah, you, you go ahead, Doug. I mean, uh, I mean, there's so many different angles to this. I, I mean, I, I had a tweet, I think, right at the end of the game, maybe as Vanderbilt got the uh, – Got that game ceiling first down when uh, Van- a- Alabama had like one timeout left, right? Um, but but I tweeted that you know Jerry Jerry kills impact on this program. We we've talked about it time after time, but he he has got to be the most. He will go down in history, in my opinion, as the most underrated program builder in all of college football. He's done it at every single level: D two, FCS, the MAC, uh, the Big Ten. Um, he, you know, he's he's battled health issues. He's done it at different areas of the country. He's done it all over the place, the Midwest, New Mexico. I mean, the the stuff that he has has done and the impact he's had on that program are are evident with with Pavia there with him. Um, but just the triple option aspects the, that that make it really tough to tough to prepare for, tough for a scout team to simulate, um, and all that was on was on full display on on. Uh, uh, on Saturday, and and then to have the moment queued up, the the Nick Saban quote to play on a loop, uh, and and I I use field storming as a just because that's what everyone says it was, but they were very politely in single file, kind of heading down to the field in the most proper field storming of all time, and then to be on Broadway and be at a bachelorette party and see for those girls to see the goalpost coming down Broadway had to be one of the most epic experiences of all. So God bless college football. Wait there for a minute, Doug. I thought you were at a bachelorette party in Nashville. I was, I was wholly confused. Um, I cannot confirm nor deny. Yeah. I like the way you spend your weekends. That's strong. Um, You know, I think that Doug has said before about Jerry kill and I can't give Doug enough credit for on that much the way that, that Zach Barnett weeks ago called out, Oklahoma State being paper Cowboys. But um, you wonder, or or I I certainly wonder, where Jerry Kill's career might be had he not had some of these very serious health issues because of the fact that he has built and rebuilt programs at an elite level. Um, Clark Lee was a part as defensive coordinator of Notre Dame's upset of then number one um, Clemson in 2020 during the COVID year. Uh, So this is the second time. Uh, in the last four years that Clark Lee has been a part of a team upsetting the number one team, vastly different circumstances in 2020. Um, I dubbed this over the weekend, Vanderbilt's Roger Maris game. Of course, Maris had 61 home runs and then Vanderbilt's 61st game against the top five opponent. Um, the Commodores got their first win. So um, we've noted here on the podcast for several weeks, it's a vastly improved Vanderbilt team. It was not a fluke when they beat Virginia Tech to open the season. That game should never have gone into overtime. And this was not a fluke. They just um, they beat Alabama wire to wire and outplayed Alabama. And Alabama still got a lot of tough games on its schedule. And I saw some commentary over the weekend that Kalen DeBoer will have to wear this loss forever, and he will. Like You wear this loss forever uh, as an Alabama coach or a Georgia coach or whomever if you've got that kind of streak and you lose to Vanderbilt. Um, my reaction starts with Diego Pavia. Um, I, I said after they beat Virginia Tech in week one that the guy's a Heisman candidate in my mind, and he's still a Heisman candidate in my mind. What does that really mean? You know, we're in the midst of what could be an epic Heisman run, uh, a Heisman race. 
This 2024 season is shaping up to be incredible. Uh, but the guy's a difference maker in every sense of the word. Uh, and he's one of those only in college football type players uh, that, that come along every so often. And just the chance to watch this guy do his thing is incredible. And at the same time, you know, I tweeted this after the game that I'm not here to defend the transfer portal as a total good. I, I understand it, it's a very much a double-edged sword, but we don't get Diego Pavia at Vanderbilt. We don't get, um, you know, moments like this without the transfer portal um, and, and the ability of guys to move and for talent to find its way to uh, places like that. Eli Stowers signed with Texas A&M in 2019 as a quarterback, wound up as New Mexico State. Now he's at Vanderbilt as, as – a, they're one of their leading cogs in their offense. Um, that's such a great story. And as you guys touched on, Tim Beck's a great story in his own right. So uh, Diego, there, there needs to be some sort of award at the end of the season for Diego Pavia. Maybe we create the De- Diego Pavia Ultimate Dude Award. I'm happy to head that up if the Pavia family wants to reach out to me. Uh, and then the, the other aspect that I think we got to get into here is the Alabama defense. Uh, in their last six quarters – they defended 16 drives, giving up eight touchdowns, two field goals, and then Vanderbilt ran out the clock at the end of the game. Three punts, two turnovers. So that's 16 drives they've stepped on the field in the last six quarters and done their job five of them. Uh, so I, I don't know what Alabama's uh, identity is defensively. They they're obviously have some holes in the secondary. You know, people said, well, this wouldn't have happened if Nick Saban was coaching. A, that's true. B, they wouldn't be as thin in the secondary if Nick Saban – uh, was still there. And again, transfer portal there, uh, double-edged sword. Uh, and then as what you said, John, uh, I, I thought you had an interesting choice of words when you said Kalen DeBoer has to wear this one. And uh, the a lot of the reaction I've seen from the Alabama fan base is, I don't like the, that he's wearing a T-shirt. How are the players supposed to be disciplined when the coach is wearing – I don't like that he's wearing a T-shirt on the field. And you know, Taylor DeVore's uh, tenure at Alabama really started on Saturday. And when you lose, the people will find anything to nitpick about you. And I'm sure no one had imagined that Taylor DeVore would be taking grief for his attire on the sidelines. But here we are. I think you make a, a great point there, Zach, in that everything is magnified when you lose. If Alabama runs the table, then that T-shirt's probably Nike's best damn selling T-shirt. But the fact is, now those T-shirts are probably being burned. And to your stat, a great one on the Bama defense. I had this one that I was talking about with Jess over the weekend as we were traveling. And that is from the second half of the Georgia game through the first half of this Vanderbilt game, Alabama was outscored in four quarters, 50 to 25. So that really drives home the point uh, of how putrid that Alabama defense is. Remember that's an Alabama defense uh, with co-defensive coordinators, guys. I know that we all respect and Kane Womack mm-hmm. and Mo Linguist. And so they're struggling like that. That's really um, bizarre to say the least. And then there was the Malachi Moore incident at the end of the game, a captain. I saw Damian Harris um, comments from a podcast with the athletic, the former tied running back, really good player. It's been a few years in the NFL. He absolutely took Malachi Moore to task and said there would be locker room justice. Had he done that under the leadership of previous regimes and said, no way that Nick Saban would have tolerated that kind of behavior. So I'm curious if Kalen DeBoer, answers that either. I believe he speaks with the media today, certainly no later than Wednesday on the SEC teleconference. Zach briefly mentioned the name Tim Beck. Tim is a legendary Pitt State head coach who then, you know, has moved a couple of places and become a really talented and adept uh, offensive coordinator uh, scheme wise. Boy, the scheme that Vanderbilt deployed, especially in the second half, Alabama had no answers. Um, uh, you'd see Pavia roll out and he'd have three good options in front of him. Uh, and you're like, golly, I mean, where is Alabama? Uh, I was very impressed with the job Tim Beck uh, did and is doing at Vanderbilt. He's, he's a good man as well. He's, he's a good guy. I'm glad to see him having the success he's having. Let's stay in the SEC. A couple other upsets. Uh, not Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah okay. Yeah. One of them's an upset. Arkansas uh, gets the Vols. JB, give me some thoughts on how that one played out. Well, um, Arkansas, first and foremost, did the best thing you can do if you're playing a Tennessee offense that is operating the way the Tennessee offense is designed to to operate, and that is Arkansas kept the ball away from the balls. I think the Hogs finished with about an 11-minute, 
edge and time of possession overall for the game, but they also had a 12 minute edge of time of possession in the first half. Um, and really Arkansas should have been in full control of that contest in the first half. It was three to nothing. And yet Arkansas had had three red zone trips. And so uh, Tennessee's offensive line is a disaster. A lot of heat on Glenn Ellerby. It's been a weak point. They have not recruited well at that position. They have not developed well at that position. And so um, I don't think all of the um, malignant comments on Nico Iamaliava are warranted. Here's a guy who has just made his sixth career start, and I think it's worth noting four of those starts have been away from Neyland Stadium. And so I don't think we know a lot yet about Nico. Now, his, his actions at the end of the game, running out of bounds without even throwing a, a prayer into the end zone, completely indefensible. And I don't lend any relief there for him being a redshirt freshman quarterback in his sixth start because he's been playing quarterback um, basically his whole life at this point. And you can't not get the throw off. I was t- talking about it again over the weekend. And I said, it, it's like being down one or two in a basketball game and your point guard dribbles it out and just lets the clock expire. That's the <laughs> exact good. same thing that Nico did. Now, you can you can question what that says more so about how they're being coached because I believe it's the third year in a row that Tennessee has had it happen. I know it happened a couple of years ago in their mustard bottle loss to Lane Kiffin inside Neyland Stadium where Joe Milton ran out of bounds without getting a throw off and the game ended. So um, I believe there was another instance where Milton had that same issue a year ago, but it's at least the second time in the past three seasons, if not three times in each of those seasons, that's certainly problematic. But the Vols issues, uh, first and foremost, are that offensive line. It's a disaster. I think they've got a six-year walk-on being forced into starting action. You shouldn't be that way if you're Tennessee. Uh, The herd kid that they got from LSU has been a massive disappointment um, at the tackle spot and has also been dinged up. So the the Vols have some issues, and they're going to play – uh, a Florida team that's got a, a modicum of confidence coming in after its week, win against Central Florida and a Florida team uh, and coaching staff that knows that the coaching staff is coaching for their lives every week. Oh, I'd say a lot more than a modicum, modicum of, of confidence uh, from Billy Napier's squad. Boy, they looked good against UCF and UCF. The, the wheels have come off. I don't know what that quarterback I, – I, mm, mm. Gus, Gus Buss is in the repair shop. Fair. It seems like there's there's been no in between uh, for Gus, Gus's offense is either completely rolling and destroying everything in its path, or they can't get out of the driveway, and there's no in between. And who would have thought Coach Prime's defense is the one that that sent it to the repair <laughs> shop? <laughs> Amazing, <laughs> incredible, Zach. I feel like Texas A&M completely exposed Missouri. Is that the way it really went down? That's what I saw. I mean, the first half it was just utter domination. Yeah, I think that's fair. Uh, Missouri was ranked number nine because they had a good season last year. Uh, they did beat Ohio State in the Cotton Bowl, but outside of that, they, they won a lot of close games. And this year, I mean, I, I wrote and then said that this team's begging to be beat, and A&M finally obliged them. They, they outplayed them uh, in every aspect of the game. Um, Connor, uh, Mike Elko and Connor Wegman made me look like a fool because I'm here, sitting here saying, well, A&M's offense is a, is a running offense. Uh, Marcel Reed's better running quarterback. Wegman is gun shy after his injury history. And then Connor Wegman went out there and put everything on the money. He was making great decisions, was sharp mentally, sharp physically, and uh, was the catalyst to a huge day for AM. And I mean, this is a team that looks like a top 10 team right now in, in AM. And Missouri doesn't even look like a top 25 team. Uh, Connor Cook looks average. Uh, I didn't like uh, Luther Burden spent. Seemed like he spent more time sulking than playing. Uh, and obviously, when you're down 24 nothing at halftime, then give up a 60-whatever-yard run to open the second half, um, you don't have a lot to cheer about. But I'd like to see better leadership out of one of Missouri's best players. Just a, a really uh, bad weekend all around for Missouri and a, a great weekend for AM. And, you know, I wrote about this yesterday. We're 16 teams in the SEC. 13 of them have a loss. Two of them are 1-0 and in conference play. And then a and alone by a relative mile in first place right now at 3-0. You know, you know real quickly, and, and a great point there, uh, especially about Lu- Luther Burden, there were shades of uh, Luther Burden Saturday and C.D. Lamb Sunday looking in- incredibly similar with their with their body mm-hmm. language on the sidelines, though the Cowboys found a way to get a win. But um, Burden has been a, a high-profile product of Missouri being uh, very proactive and successful under 
drink uh, in the NIL space. And so you get more criticism when that comes. And I wanted to tie that back together with the Tennessee situation. Nico Iamaliava uh, was the original poster boy for NIL money. Uh, the Spire Group spent a lot of money to help Tennessee get Nico Iamaliava. Heard is an NIL guy. They've got a bunch of NIL guys on that team. I think the criticism, uh, that's a little bit of a microscope on those two of what's going to become more and more commonplace as the monetary numbers grow and it's more widespread and people understand just how much these guys are making and then are being uh, or are underperforming in some instances or not being put in position to be successful. We're going to see and hear more of this criticism. And then I also want to just give a shout out to the Arkansas coaching staff because um, that's a culture win for Arkansas. That's a program win when the hogs have had as many heartbreaking close losses, mm -hmm. not just this year, but last year, as well and yet they find a way to come back and get that done even when their uh, quarterback green goes down with injury from a from a brutal hit um then the red shirt freshman uh malachi washington comes in and yeah, helps yeah. lead them <clears throat> um a couple things missouri did have in first half they had a couple of long passes that they just missed and then you know one got called back uh it was just so close missouri could have had that it could have changed everything, but you know, there's was, also that fourth down on their first drive that they threw the flag for obvious pass interference and then picked it up. For, picked it up. I don't know yeah. why. Yeah, that was. Interesting. Uh, but I then you I, lose the game, forty-one to ten. Yeah, I think I think I saw a stat at halftime that that Texas A&M was like seven for nine on third downs. Like you you can't give up third down conversions at that clip. And and looking at the end of the game, I think A&M was averaging like six and a half yards of carry. So. You're handing the ball off on first down and facing second and four. Like you're, you're converting third downs at a pretty good clip, and you, you can't expect to win a game as a top ten team playing. That Zach's game. masterful every week with the box scores and, and showing how box scores reveal the winners and losers. And and the big box score element out of Texas A&M Missouri, in my opinion, was Texas A&M had about 525 yards of offense, and Missouri had 250. So hard to win games like that, um, even if you had a couple of penalties go against you early. JB, I want to give you uh, props, and I want to issue a challenge to you. Uh, I thought on on the preview pod uh, from Thursday, you nailed it with Ohio State. You said, you know, Ohio State's going to win this game. They're just better than Iowa. They're going to pull away. But I, so I think Iowa's going to keep it pretty darn close and hang in there, and we'll see what happens. You nailed that. The challenge is you do such a wonderful job of uh, saying Nico's last name. If you can work that in one or two more times in this pod somewhere, it doesn't really matter where, I'd like to hear it because you do a wonderful job and I enjoy it. Uh, give me some thoughts on Ohio State being able to pull away in the second half from Iowa. You know what? I think the Buckeyes I, – I said going into the season. Now, this is not hindsight. I said going into the season, Texas was my personal number one team, Georgia number two, and Ohio State number three. I'm inching closer and closer to thinking Ohio State might be the number one team in the country. And I, matter of fact, think we're going to see Ohio State stake a lot of claim this week in Eugene, Oregon, Eugene. for being the number one team in the country. Uh, Jeremiah Smith is incredible. Uh, Emeka is incredible at the wide receiver position. Uh, Will Howard was one of the uh, really coveted guys at the quarterback position this past cycle. Um, and they look like uh, – and Ohio State kind of had its pick of quarterbacks there. They talked to Cam Ward a little bit. They had some interest in Riley Leonard. Um, but what he's doing is phenomenal. Chip is doing a great job running that offense. And then uh, Knowles, in the third year of him being in charge of that defense, I think that's where you see the biggest difference in Ohio State. They're just a much better defensive football team than we've seen, in my opinion, at, at any point in the Ryan Day era. Georgia and Ole Miss did what they needed to do. They needed, they got back on track, right? Uh, both played very good teams. I mean, Auburn, uh, you know, gave Georgia more than they wanted. Uh, South Carolina, uh, who had just beaten the dog out of Kentucky earlier in the season. Kentucky had gotten Ole Miss. Ole Miss comes to South Carolina, and Ole Miss just whipped them. Uh, thoughts there, anybody? I don't, I don't have a lot of thoughts, but uh, I think it, it, was, it was good to see Ole Miss get back on track against the South Carolina team that I, I don't know what, what they are. Like, I mean, they are kind of the epitome of where this college football season is, where these teams are just so different from week to week. And obviously for South Carolina, they need Lenore Sellers to be healthy. Uh, he was playing. 
but it looked like he was trying to avoid being injured, uh, which is a dangerous place to be uh, when you're playing football. And obviously he, he's given his team everything he has. I would just, for South Carolina's sake, like to see them play as much as possible with Sellers at quarterback because they're, they're a dangerous team when he's 100%. Yeah, and, and their offense has some real issues. I was talking with uh, some colleagues, some not colleagues, but some some peers who cover the Gamecocks over the weekend trying to gauge the temperature there. And uh, there's a lot of heat on Dow Loggins. He's, uh, he's getting more heat than anybody right now associated with that South Carolina program. Of course, he's the offensive coordinator. Uh, we remember when, when Beamer went through that process and uh, sort of snapped at reporters in the, the Dow Loggins introductory press conference. Um, who, who questioned the hire, and now here we are a year and a half into Dow Loggins running the offense, and there's still a lot of questions. So that's going to chart the, the rest of South Carolina season, certainly the health of Lenora Sellers, how much Shane Beamer can keep them bought in and invested as these early losses mount up, and, and then how much heat Dow Loggins continues to receive and, and how he and the Gamecocks respond to it. Uh I want to shift gears. We're 20 minutes in. I got about 15 more that I want to touch on. So I'm going to be a little quick on this. UNLV had Syracuse in town Friday night, goes to overtime. Syracuse finds a way to get the win. Uh, somebody picked that. Uh, UNLV still has a crack at Boise and maybe two cracks at Boise. Boise looks ready to go. Boise looks really good. Genty's going to win the Heisman. I'll just continue to let you all know that. Uh, any thoughts on those two? Yeah, I mean, I, I, Boise's, I, to me, head and shoulders the best team in that conference because, as you said, JT is head and shoulders the best player in college football right now. And when you have such an advantage there and it, it's so obvious that JT can run for 200 anytime he wants it and then all of the things that opens up outside of him when he, he's going to trap 22 eyeballs on every single play, it's, it's tough to imagine Boise not, not, winning, not beating UNLV twice, in my opinion. Yeah, UNLV is very good. I don't know about they, they are good, but I mean, I just, my, it, but I, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm 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 on Zach's uh, side here in in this in terms of I think Boise is the class of, of the group of five teams, and I think Boise is proving that um, it could compete with a lot of power conference teams by the way it stood toe to toe with Oregon, and then the fact that it just woodshedded. Washington State a week ago, uh, Ashton Genty certainly going to be in New York. I'm not handing him the Heisman just yet, uh, just because I think there's still some some high profile players out there who are just going mm-hmm. to get um, more visibility that could sway that race. But I I want to tie this all together to the fact that Army and Navy remain unbeaten. They're both having incredible seasons. Um, they're both five and zero. I want to say I saw for the first time since 1937. Certainly the first time since the, the 1930s or 40s that both of these teams this deep into the season have been 5-0. and They played December 14th, uh, their annual incredible rivalry contest. But they both played Notre Dame before that in Metro New York, one at Yankee Stadium, one at MetLife Stadium. College football playoff bids go out on Sunday, December 8th, I think it is. But what if Army and Navy are still undefeated with – wins over Notre Dame each by that point in time. What does that do to the college football playoff selection? Nobody has encountered this um, potential. Nobody's ever thought this would be possible. Certainly I didn't, but it's just an interesting thing for me to think about as we talk about some group of five teams there that Army and Navy conceivably could be undefeated at that point in time and each have a win against the Notre Dame team that's now once again lurking around the top ten. I just think it's fascinating. About about 10 days ago, I called Zach and I said, hey, Zach, I can see a scenario where Army and Navy are in it at the end uh, and they play after Selection Sunday. How's this play out? And Zach masterfully explained it to me. So Zach explained to me if Army and Navy are in it, they are the top rated, uh, one of them is the top rated. How does this play out? Well, so they're both in the American Athletic Conference, which is for the first time this year. So if if they would play in the AAC championship game December 7th, right. the winner of that, assuming they're undefeated, uh, is chosen for the playoff. And then they'll play again December 14th. And what would basically at that point just be a glorified 
the most glorified scrimmage in college football history. Uh, and that, that game in, in and of itself is sacred. And uh, so that game's not going anywhere. Um, but the, the winner of that, if, if it comes to be, you'd be looking at playing your season, playing a third, or I guess playing a 12th game in your uh, conference championship game, potentially against each other, then playing again a 13th game a week later, and then you'd be playing that the following weekend to open up the college football playoff. So that, that's a, a tough, tough uh, late November, December for whoever gets there. But um, I, I hope we do. That would be great for college football. That would be great to see. Uh, one more note here since we're talking about it. Um, going to be on the site uh, here shortly later on this morning. So Army and Navy are first and third nationally in rushing. Uh, no surprise, Boise State, Ashton JT is basically second by himself. And then in passing efficiency, Army is first in the country right now in passing efficiency. Navy is second. So the, the success of those teams, I, in my mind, boils down to those stats right there. Yeah, it's very it's important to understand that. So at the end of the regular season, uh, in the American Athletic Conference's conference championship game, which would be like that Sunday, uh, the Saturday before Selection Sunday, right – uh, those two teams, if they were both undefeated, they both both beat Notre Dame, uh, they play. And if Boise State and UNLV kind of mix and match and there's no clear thing there, the American champion could be the highest rated conference champ. Uh, let's, I'm, I'm making this up. I'm picking Army, Navy, throwing up in the air. Say it's Army. If Army wins the conference championship game and they're the highest rated of the group of five, they would be in the playoff. Then the next week they would play in the traditional Army-Navy game Forget, oh, one just beat another. It's, it's, we get again, America wins. They get an absolute battle. Everyone would love to see the rematch. Uh, that would be amazing. Like, this has never happened. Army and Navy playing twice, uh, back to back weeks. And then, like Zach said, then they'd have another game the very next week. This would be just incredible. Like, so let's throw, let's throw one, be. let's throw one more detail in here. So the top four seeds go to the four highest rated conference champions. Let's say Navy, let's just say Army beats Notre Dame, beats Navy, beats an undefeated Navy in the conference championship. And at that point, no matter they're on December 8th, they're what is it, 12 and 0 or 13 and 0, whatever the 12 and 0, whatever the number would be. Are we sure that that team is not the fourth highest rated conference champion? Like, who do we know that's going to come out of the Big 12? The Big 12 champion could very well have two or three losses. The ACC champion looks like Miami. And Clemson and SMU are the class of that conference, but who knows who emerges from there. The Big Ten champion and the SEC champion are going to be in the top four. They're going to be in the top two. We could see Army or Navy sneak in there as the fourth seed, and then they wouldn't be playing that weekend. They would, they would get off until New Year's Day. That would be incredible as well. That, that's a possibility on the table. This is, yeah. one of my, this is one of my funnest, most enjoyable college football um, hypotheticals that um, I can remember discussing – any time ever, and Doug knows this because he took his dad a year ago, the Army-Navy game is such a magical, magical event. Just think about what it would be if it was sandwiched in between uh, the AAC title game and a college football playoff game. And then the other thing I would point out is, what about cadet life if one of those teams advances yeah. into the college football playoff? That's just, uh, you know, as I like to say, crazy town banana land. That's wild. <laughs> Phenomenal. All right, so we talked about we, – we mentioned Miami right there. And I got to tell you guys, I turned it off. They're down 20 in the fourth. And I was like, eh, okay. <laughs> and then what happened? I, I, what happened? I did not turn it off. Um, I was, uh, I think, doing the same thing that Zach was doing, and that is channel surfing between Minnesota, USC. We'll talk about Lincoln Riley's problems, I'm sure – channel surfing between the Vols and the Hogs, and then channel surfing between uh, the Bears and the Canes. And um, there were some bad uh, officiating moments in that contest that I think, once again, uh, are bringing ACC officiating crews into the spotlight. Whether you agree with that or not, that's just the facts. Um, but um, Cal should have never been in the position to have that game decided by targeting, non-targeting, targeting, non-targeting, non Paul uh, against Mendoza, the really fine Cal red shirt, sophomore quarterback. And then Miami just um, never gave up. And Cam Ward earned those NIL dollars. And Cal, which has one of the best defensive coaches and in, in head coach Justin Wilcox in all of college football, 
had an inexplicable uh, breakdown. And then there was another really controversial call later in that, a roughing the passer call that I thought was pretty ticky tack. So um, kudos to the Canes. Um, it takes a lot of courage to um, and belief to be down 35 to 10 on the road in that environment and find a way to win. Uh, again, keeping Zach's bold prediction alive and well. So I did not uh, uh, stay up for the end of this one uh, like you, Scott, or uh, like I was, uh, my eyes were shut by the end of it. But I, Cam Ward uh, for me is a candidate for the inaugural Diego Pavia Dude of the Year. Uh, and just, he's just so fascinating to watch because I've, I've hardly seen a quarterback operate with the mastery that he does and the casualness that he does. And it, it, it's his saving grace in his Achilles heel. That pick six that he threw was just one of the worst pick sixes, one of the most needless pick sixes you'll ever see a, a quarterback throw. And it's just like, I, I've been around, I've seen everything. I, I can I can cam ward my way out of this. And then he throws it, you know, into coverage, across his body, all that stuff over the middle of the field, all the stuff you're not supposed to do. And then he's gotta play his way out of his own mistakes to along with his defense and the rest of his team to save it. And you're looking now for Miami at two straight weeks where they've had to um, save themselves from themselves. And typically when that happens, you've got multiple losses uh, coming for you. I've got to plug my laptop in here, but can we have to acknowledge the the college game day environment at Cal was bonkers. Some of the best, <laughs> some of the best like college game day signs I've ever seen. Uh, I think they broke down, broke down the barrier at like five o'clock in the morning or something like the, uh, we, we need to get college game day on more of these, these campuses that it's never seen. Cause it's, it's bonkers. No, that's well, a great point, Doug. It, uh, he, he does such a great point. That's what a mic drop from Doug. He's now gone. <laughs> it's out. I hate for him uh, to miss this well, point. I hate for him to miss this point real quickly though, Zach. Um, yeah. They probably thought tearing down the barricades was just part of it because there's all the protests. Protest. All the Switch. time, <laughs> that that like they practiced for this. They were more ready to tear down the game day barricade right. than any program in the history of game day. I'm telling you, they thought that was part of the game day experience. It's Cal Berkeley. Well, so what I, I what I was going to say is we're we're in these season long sport wide conversations about how much college football has changed over these past five years, and so many people we're all coming to grips with it in real time. The portal. Uh, the 12 team playoff and um, what we saw at Vanderbilt and Cal and Arkansas and what we've seen so far this season is the, the, the fatal flaw of the four team playoff was it focused so much of the season on these seven, eight teams that had a chance to win the national championship. And yeah, Alabama season's not over because they lost to Vanderbilt, whereas in years past, it probably would have been. Tennessee season's not over. Um, let's just, whether that's true or not, let's just take it as a point. But it's now – I mean, Vanderbilt has belief. Arkansas has belief. Cal has belief. And when you give these schools belief and a reason to buy into their teams, we're paid back tenfold by what, the, what we've seen on these campuses. And that's going to continue. We're going to have so many more meaningful games in November to whereas November – if you weren't in the top seven in November, your season, you were told, was over. And now it's not. And so there, it, it's a double-edged sword to everything. It, Alabama and Georgia and Tennessee are able to shake off these losses to where they wouldn't have before, but we're going to have so we're, we've given so many more fan bases a reason to celebrate their teams and look at the results. Agreed. And here's what it does. Also, thing. it basically starts generating in season playoff games. And it's not that we haven't had those in the four team era. It's just that we're going to have more and more of the in season playoff games. Alabama has South Carolina this week and Tennessee has Florida. And then those two teams meet in their annual third Saturday in October rivalry here in 12 days inside Neyland Stadium. That, in a lot of ways, becomes an in-season playoff game because you don't want to head into final five-week stretch of your season, of your regular season, being the team already with two losses um, because then you are um, hoping to win out and also get a little bit of help along the way. So uh, a great point by you, Zach. And, and Doug, I know you heard the tail end of it, but I just want to reiterate those Cal Berkeley kids were accustomed to tearing down barricades. Uh, Justin Wilcox, his uh, like start of the fourth quarter type on-field interview uh, with TV, you know, he, he straight faced. I'm not kidding. He's like, y'all, Miami's really good. We have got to continue or else we're going to lose this game. 
And I was like, dude, you got this one. Nope, <laughs> sure didn't. Dude knows what he's talking about. That was fascinating to me. All right, uh, on the other side of the fence, Clemson and Iowa State. Let's let's touch on those two real quick. Clemson has just come back and is a different football team entirely. JB, I see you nodding head. Give me thoughts there. You know, I think we're seeing uh, more Garrett Riley's imprint on the offense. Kate Klubnick has grown and developed. Um, they're not as explosive as they were when they were a really, really elite team. Uh, but their defense is going to keep them in every game, and their offense is doing more and more every week to win more games. So um, we thought it might be a three-team race in the ACC going into the season with Clemson, Miami, and FSU. Um, and I think it's clearly a two-team race, even though hats off to Pat Narduzzi and, and the pit crew for being 5-0 and somehow, some way. Um, and really being one of the surprise, the positive surprise teams in college football. Uh, Zach, how about Iowa State? Iowa State's got a huge test with West Virginia coming. Uh, but give me, I mean, Iowa State's undefeated. Yeah, I mean, they took care of business against, against a down Baylor team. Uh, but I mean, they're they're five and zero. I mean, you look at it's similar to the SC, you were. What is it? I honestly, a Big Tail Twelve is now a sixteen team conference. I had to. I honestly, between the ACC, all this, I had to check myself. But most of the preseason conversation was around Kansas State, Utah, with a little bit of Oklahoma State and Kansas thrown in, at least in my mind. Uh, it, the, the consensus was it's Kansas State or Utah's conference to win. And now, I mean, it's early days still, but the undefeated teams in Big 12 play are Texas Tech, BYU, all Iowa State, Colorado, and West Virginia. Uh, West Virginia went to Stillwater. <laughs> and beat the dog out of a, a last-place Oklahoma State team. Uh, BYU, I mean, their, their win at SMU now looks like one of the best non-conference wins anybody has in college football right now. Uh, I saw by some metric, maybe ESPNs, they have the number one strength of record uh, in all of college football right now. Um, Colorado, it's amazing that we're now 40 minutes into a college football podcast or 38 minutes and haven't mentioned them uh, really so far. Uh, Texas Tech has shrugged off a, a bad loss at Washington State and is playing good football. Uh, went on the road and held Arizona to 16 points. Um, this is a this is a conference a, a season where you know you could put all the 16 teams into a puzzle box, shake it up 100 times, and get a, probably 90 different champions. Uh, but those teams right now are are off to the the, the fastest start in that in that conference, and it'd be fascinating to see who emerges. I, I think for Matt Campbell the that that win over Iowa has just propelled their season. They, then they beat the beat the dog crap out of Arkansas State. They shut out Houston. This Baylor win is is big. And then they've got West Virginia, UCF, Texas Tech, Kansas, and Cincinnati before they see another ranked opponent ending the season with Utah and Kansas State. Um, so I mean, we we could see a ten and O team uh, coached by Matt Campbell heading into those last two weeks. It's it's not not crazy to think. Um, and, and I think they're they're ranked like top eleven in the latest AP poll. So um, be be interesting to see how these next few games shake out for them. That's a tough schedule. I mean, honestly, there's a, there's a, a lot of potential bumps along the way. If they if they are ten or zero, getting to those last two, that's impressive in my opinion. Uh, West Virginia. I mean, goodness, what happened to Oklahoma State? Uh, they were outrushed like three some three sixty to sixty or something like that. Something horrible. Like they cannot run the ball and they cannot stop the run at all. And, and I think Allie Gordon left the game banged up. I wonder if we've seen the last the last of Ali Gordon at Oklahoma State. And I think we mentioned that a couple weeks ago on the pod. But yep. when you're when, when you're last place in the league, there's and you're a future NFL talent. There's limited reasons to play. And your offensive line is trash. Excuse me. That wasn't very nice. You, you stole my line. Also you true. have absolutely um, amalgamated my line there because that is something that I very, very often use. But but you're right, and uh, we've said it. And um, as some of these teams are more and more surprised, multi-loss teams before we even hit mid-October, makes you wonder how many hamstring injuries are going to pop up. Or I don't know. I don't want to. I don't want to sound like I officiated the South Carolina Ole Miss game. <laughs> Shane Beamer, John Bryce. Uh, Indiana just keeps 
being Indiana and Sig just keeps saying, Hey guys, we're going to keep winning. We're going to keep winning. We're going to keep winning. I love the guy. He's fantastic. Yeah. I heard some talk, not, not from this show, of course, but other preview pods that I listened to about, you know, is, is Indiana, uh, are we sure they're going to go to Northwestern? Is Northwestern going to give them trouble? And I was like, really? It's Indiana. Like it's, it's coach Sig. You understand how, what this juggernaut that he's built? It's his world. And we're just living in it. Like, who are you talking yourself into Northwestern at Indi- staying with Indiana? Absolutely not. Now, yes, you said that on the podcast Thursday too. And, and as I chimed in, I said, no, I think Northwestern makes this a okay. game deep into the second half. And it was 27 24. And then the SIG belief took over and they closed that game out with a 41 to 24 win. So we were both right. Correct. <laughs> One of you guys, well, you mentioned we mentioned SMU twice. Uh, that BYU SMU game, SMU's quarterback, it just that just wasn't right. But boy, SMU is a different team, you know, these past couple of weeks, and uh, they look well coached, well prepared. They're explosive. Uh, SMU's got the potential to 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 cause some havoc later in the season. Yeah, and, and Kevin Jennings has opened that up for him. I love seeing the quarterback draw go for 60 something yards i mean just the simplest play in in this complex sport and it's just the ball the guy that catches the snap is going to run untouched for a long touchdown it's going to work watch it and then it does and and smu had control in that game for the majority of the game but finally louisville has found a way to claw back and get the contest tied up and a guy that i think we all respect um as a head coach and certainly as an offensive mind and jeff brom calls like back-to-back run plays on third and short at the the SMU 20 and the most unimaginative back-to-back play calls I think I've ever seen from Jeff Brom and SMU um, which I thought looked faster on both sides of the ball than Louisville and Louisville looked faster than Notre Dame a lot last week so that tells you about the overall team speed of SMU but then they just try to run Tyler Shuck into the middle of the offensive line on fourth and a very, very long yard, more like a yard and a half. Um, And he didn't even come close. And then that gave the momentum and belief and everything else right back to SMU, who went down and executed and won the football game. I just thought um, we've seen some late game clock management issues from Louisville two weeks in a row now. I thought that reared its head. And I also just uh, thought that was a completely head scratching play. And then to your point, Zach, about how well coached SMU was, Louisville a week ago really hurt Notre Dame with some rollout throwback stuff to the tight end or dragging a guy across. They tried to set some of that same stuff up against SMU, and SMU snuffed it out, and that left Tyler Shuck shook, and I thought that was um, evidence of a really, really good job of coaching. The respect that I have for the job Brian Vincent has done at Louisiana Monroe is is hard to express. Uh, The confidence – I saw some 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 little rumblings and I saw some tweets. I saw some stuff midweek basically saying, y'all about to see James Madison's a really good football team and we're going to beat them. And, and let me show you why we're going to beat them. And when we beat them, I want you to understand what we just accomplished. And then he just goes out there and does it and just moves on. He's just on to the next one. <laughs> Dude, wow. He's got to be in, in Coach of the Year uh, conversations nationally. Uh, I mean – I'll, I'll look it up after this. When's the last time ULM started four and one? When's the last time ULM won four games in a season? I mean, it feels like three has been their ceiling for a long, long time, and he's he's busted through that ceiling uh, with a hammer. Uh, they're four and one with only a loss at Texas uh, and beating one of the most respected programs in that conference. So uh, he he's he's got to be uh, a national coach of the year leader and the win they had over UAB a couple weeks ago has got to be the leader for most satisfying individual victory of any team this season. Yeah. The contrast of his success versus what's happening in UAB has been very, very (laughs) sending a message. Mm -hmm. Where's uh, where's a nice parabolic field mic when you need it after seeing that Trent Dilfer, John Summerall post game exchange. So that's, that's what I want it. Yeah. I think we need to get some type of like word counter on here for JB on words that he uses that I could not, I, I could not repeat. Uh, amalgamatic, oh. am, am <laughs> like I, 
I, parabolic Mike. I mean, I, I'm just I'm just a football coach here on the podcast. Ian Maliava, Doug. Say it with me. You're a football coach. That sounds like one of your play calls. Ian Maliava. Also, uh, Scott, there you go. There's two more references. I'll work Thank in another. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. All right. Well, I'm going to give you a couple opportunities. Uh, so the last two I got, we talked about them briefly each, but Florida and Pitt. Uh, Florida has, has just found some identity, and now I think they're uh, – they're a potential to cause havoc as well. And then Pitt, I mean, hats off. You know, Narduzzi had to make some changes. And uh, he let go a lot of guys that have been with him for a long time. A, guy, a lot of guys he respects. And he said, you know, we have to go. We have to do something different. The AD gets let go. It's a, it's a, it's a tenuous situation at Pitt. And the guy's 5-0. and oh. Come on, man. How about those two stories? I don't know how much uh, credit Florida deserves as opposed to how much, I mean, we, we've already talked about the Gus bus being in the, being in the repair shop. I mean, they're, they're searching for their identity after leading the country and rushing for those first three weeks. I think, I mean, Florida had a 17 point um, second quarter and then didn't score any points in the second half to just kind of hang on. So uh, is it a win he needed? Absolutely. But I, I don't think it's as, as impressive as, as, as maybe a lot of people think it is. Yeah, I think um, for me, it, it, it's Pitt. I mean, they have a really quality win now um, against West Virginia that looks better and better every week. That's their best win. Uh, they went on the road and won at Cincinnati, and there was a road game where they won at North Carolina over the weekend, and, and Doug has done a fabulous job of, of kind of outlining how fraught the North Carolina situation is with Mac Brown. Um, but now we get Pitt and Cal this weekend. Cal coming to uh, the venue formerly known as Heinz Field in what should be a really compelling uh, throwback ACC game. They've got a chance to be 6-0 and with a bye week and then have Syracuse, which is vastly improved and playing um, much better than I expected this year the week after that. And then they've got a, a looming showdown a little later with um, SMU, and then they've still got Clemson on the schedule. Um, but really fascinating – Florida is playing much better defense. You're right. Um, the Gus bus is not the offensive juggernaut we associate with a lot of Gus Malzahn teams. Um, but that Florida defense, if it can rattle on that Tennessee offensive line, which is already rattled and searching for confidence and searching for the right chemistry, then certainly they can get to Nico Iamaliava and um, really make life miserable for the Vols. JB wins this podcast. <laughs> Also, I believe he and Zach tied for the win uh, in picks this week. Uh, Let's go, this baby. This point Someone week, finally on my level. <laughs> come, on, come, on. come on. How about how about my calves? Who's? Who's? Let's Zach, go, who's? Zach is set up for a brutal fall off the ladder <laughs> at some point. It's just going to be like he, the whole, he built it a year ago. Did he, not, did he not go down sure I, a year ago? And I don't mean tearing probably. down barricades. Gentlemen, that's all I got for this podcast. Anybody got anything else they want to bring up real fast? We're almost an hour in. Uh, real quick, shout out to Houston. Unde uh, uh, undefeated. Uh, blanked for two straight games. Uh, did not score a point in two straight games. Then went out and put 30 on TCU Friday night on the road. Uh, four nothing turnovers edge for the Cougars. Uh, the no one has ever doubted Willie Fritz's ability to coach. Uh, he's going to get the most out of his team. So shout out to, to them for figuring something out. I'll tell you guys, this upcoming week is everything you want in college football. So we might have to do two preview shows. I'm just saying. I'm down. Think about it. Think about it. All Got right. It. Football Scoop Podcast. We are out. <laughs>